I'm Alex Swolinski, and you're listening to Go, a podcast for the curious traveler. Today, I'm going to take you to the Pampas of Argentina. The Pampas in South America covers nearly 300,000 square miles and extends into Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay. The land here is relatively flat and is marked by rolling green hills. Grass thrives in this area, making it the perfect place for raising cattle. This is also South America's tornado country, and huge thunderstorms are known to cause dangerous flash flooding. Now, I came to this region to volunteer and work at a horse and cattle ranch in an area called Mercedes, Argentina. It was about a 10-hour bus ride to get here from the capital city, Buenos Aires. To catch a bus, first you have to get to the Retiro bus terminal. It's huge, with 75 platforms. It operates a lot like an airport does. When you walk in, it's very busy, and there are a lot of bus companies selling tickets to different places in South America, like Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Santiago, Chile. The ticket to get here will cost you about 60 US dollars. Now, the long distance buses in South America are actually really comfortable. The seats recline quite a bit, not to the point where you're laying down, but you can sleep pretty comfortably on these rides. Now, when I got to Mercedes, one of the first things I noticed was the way the locals spoke Spanish. They had such a strong accent that it didn't even sound like they were speaking Spanish at all. That's because a lot of the words they used weren't Spanish. In fact, they were from a language called Guarani. Guarani is the most widely used indigenous language in the Americas. And in this area, both Guarani and Spanish borrow words from each other. Here's a clip of a local woman speaking Guarani. Now, the ranch where I was volunteering had about 500 acres of green rolling hills. There were also about 800 cattle, 200 horses, 50 donkeys, several chickens, two cattle working dogs, and one very loud rooster. Since I didn't have any horseback riding experience, I spent the first several days taking lessons in a large cattle pen from Raul, one of the local ranch workers. The other time, I spent grooming the horses, cleaning their hooves, feeding them, and watching the gauchos herd different groups of cattle into the pens. Gauchos are the cowboys of Argentina. They share common traits with the American cowboy, like a penchant for lawlessness, skilled horsemanship, and ruggedness. In this area of Argentina, they say a man without a horse is a man without legs. Like the American cowboy, the gauchos flourished in the mid to late 1800s, and they also lived in less inhabited parts of their country. And gauchos carry an important set of tools that are essential for life in the Pampas, like the rebenque. This tool is essentially a flat rawhide whip, about two feet long and two inches wide. It's used to motivate the cattle and horses to move quicker. Then they have the boleadores. These are a throwing weapon unique to South America. It's made out of three dense balls connected together by a rope. Each rope cord is about two feet long. The boleadores are used to catch animals by throwing them at their feet, which entangles their legs. Indigenous people have used these tools for thousands of years for hunting and in warfare. Gachos also carry the traditional lasso to catch runaway cattle and horses and no toolkit is complete without a knife. The gauchos have a blade called the facon. It can range anywhere from 10 to 20 inches in length. It's a thick blade used as a weapon, a tool, and an eating utensil. By my second week at the ranch, I went on my first supervised ride through the grasslands. I went out with a gaucho who looked like he could have been 30 years old. His name was Antonio, but really he was 19 years old. He'd been working as a gaucho since he was 13 and dropped out of school not long after to do this full time. One of the daily tasks here is to walk the perimeter of the ranch and make sure none of the wire fences are damaged. Cattle and horses often get tangled in the wire since their eyesight isn't so great. At least once a week, one of the animals would need to get their legs freed. Some of the other weekly tasks for the gauchos is to herd anywhere from 50 to 100 cattle through a special wash. This wash is like a shallow canal full of water and pesticides to wash away the ticks and keep their wounds clean. Eventually, Antonio started letting me work alongside the other gauchos. 
One day I went out to round up a large group of cattle so we could get a head count and tag the younger animals. The horse I'd been riding was a gorgeous light brown criollo named Talia. She was a great horse, mild-mannered, obedient, and strong. Now the criollo horse breed are known for being great horses. To tell us a little bit more, I spoke with Aurora, who operates criollo-horse.com. Aurora de Combe. It's complicated, yeah. <laughs> In Spanish, it's like um, Aurora, the criollo for that. It's maybe one of the best breed ever because they have all the... She likes this breed so much that she imported two horses to her home in France. I imported like 10 years ago uh, a horse, a stallion from Argentina. I imported another one last year. It's a young mare. Riders like Aurora like this type of horse for their strength and obedience. They are like really quiet horses, but so much power. I mean, they are like really powerful horses. And you just yeah. feel it when you ride them. You say, oh, my God, OK, it's like you can go so fast. And at the same time, when you just want to stand and just look at the, the landscape, the horse is super quiet and he just wait for you. And the stamina of these horses are unmatched in the world. All the longest trip with the horses were made with criollos, actually. The horse to have traveled the farthest in a single direction was a criollo by the name of Sufridor. In 1988, two separate riders rode him from Tierra del Fuego, which is near the southern tip of Chile, to the northern slopes of Alaska. The trip took five and a half years to complete. Now, Criollos first got their reputation for long journeys in 1925, when Swiss-born Argentine horseback rider Ami Felix Scheffeli rode two Criollos from Buenos Aires to Washington, D.C. The trip was again repeated with Criollos in 2004, by South African Moraine Dutois, who started in Buenos Aires and ended in New York City. Trips like these have earned the Criollo a reputation of being the hardiest of horses. Before many breeders in Argentina will select a male Criollo for breeding, it must pass an extremely rigorous test called La Marcha. So you just have your horse, you bring the horse to, to a big, big field where he will meet many other horses competing. Horses are required to be in this empty field with nothing but grass to eat. 20 days before the test begins, the horses can't be ridden or given any supplements. After this waiting period, La Marcha begins. The course is 466 miles long and must be completed in 14 days. This comes out to be 33 miles of travel each day, and the horses must carry 200 pounds for the duration of the event. The criollos that complete La Marcha are then inspected by veterinarians. These horses then become the prime candidates for breeding. These standards have made these horses famous for their endurance capabilities. Now back at the ranch, the full-time gauchos working here were each younger than 25 years old, with the youngest being 16. When I first got there, I thought they were all at least in their 30s from their level of maturity and the way they acted. One of the gauchos, his name is Marco, was on the run from trouble in Buenos Aires. Uh, lucky for him, the pay was under the table, so he wouldn't have to worry about reporting his taxes or anything and getting caught. Now, I never found out what he was wanted for, but he did say he could never go back to Buenos Aires. In the background, you can hear cattle and dogs barking. Now, these are working dogs, and in Argentina, they can come from all different breeds. This ranch had two small working dogs, Chancla and Rosita. They worked with the gauchos every day, and they were just as effective as rounding up cattle as one gaucho. These dogs needed little to no instruction, and they knew exactly what was expected of them. They were both mixed breeds. Rosita was a medium-sized dog, about 40 pounds, with short black hair. Chancla was a small dog, about 20 pounds. She worked twice as hard as some of the horses. As small as these dogs were, they covered a lot of ground, running up to 15 miles a day. Injuries didn't stop them either. Chancla would work with a limping back leg and could chase down any runaway cow, no matter how big. Now in the Pampas region, all the cattle here eat grass instead of grain or feed. The Pampas also gives them 
an enormous amount of space to roam and get a lot of exercise. These cows don't take any hormones either, but this means they take longer to mature in size. This way of raising cattle is more expensive due to the amount of land, time, and gauchos needed. However, these cattle don't require antibiotics like feedlot cattle. Feedlot cattle live in small grassless lots and eat grain packed with antibiotics. The drugs keep them from getting sick since they're essentially defecating where they sleep and eat. More and more cattle in Argentina are being produced this way, making it harder for gauchos to find work and get paid fairly. By my third week at the ranch, I was going out on horseback on my own. I'd inspect the gates, the fences, and huge sections of the property. They even encouraged me to learn how to lasso, which is a lot harder than it looks. Every weekend, I'd go into the town of Mercedes to pick up supplies like beer and food and other essentials. Now, in town, I came across several small red shrines on the side of the road. These little shrines, I learned later, were in dedication to a legendary figure of northern Argentina. His name was Gaucho Gil. Though he's not recognized by the Catholic Church, Gaucho Gil is a local saint. In the mid-1800s, Gaucho Gil fought for the Argentine army as a skilled cavalryman during a war against Paraguay. After returning home as a hero, he was drafted again, this time to fight in Argentina's civil war. But Gaucho Gil wanted to live a life of peace. He was tired of fighting, and so he deserted the army, and as a result, he became a fugitive. This put him in a tough spot. Now, he wasn't able to just return to his local home and live out publicly in the open, so he became an outlaw. He evaded capture while stealing from the wealthy and giving to the poor. For years, this went on. This earned him the reputation of a Robin Hood figure. He was even known as a miracle worker with healing powers and immunity to bullets. Eventually, though, he was captured. The police sent him to trial immediately, and he was sentenced to death soon after. But the community was strongly against this decision and demanded a pardon. Local police, aware of the backlash following the sentence, quickly took Gaucho Gil outside of town where they could execute him. Legend has it that Gaucho Gil was hung upside down by his feet beneath a tree in the countryside. Since he was immune to bullets, it was decided that his neck would be slit instead of facing a firing squad. Meanwhile, at the courthouse, another judge had ordered that the gaucho be pardoned immediately. But no one could find where the police had taken him. While hanging upside down, Gaucho Gil somehow knew that a pardon had been granted. He warned the executioner that he would be killing an innocent man and that if he did, the man's son would become very, very sick. The executioner lifted his blade to the gaucho's neck. Before sliding it across, Gaucho Gil quickly said that the only way to heal his son would be to pray to the gaucho himself so that he could personally ask God to heal the boy. The executioner went ahead and ended the gaucho's life. His body was left in the countryside. Upon returning home, the executioner discovered that his son was very sick. The boy was bedridden for days, and there was nothing the doctors or priests could do. They told him to prepare for the worst. Running out of options, the man got on his knees and prayed to Gaucho Gil. He apologized for not listening to him and begged for mercy. The next morning, the boy's health began to improve, and by the afternoon, he was fully cured. The executioner returned to Gaucho Gil's body and gave him a proper burial. He told the townspeople what had happened, and ever since that moment, they have been praying to Gaucho Gil for everything from better grades at school to curing heart problems. Today, over 200,000 people a year visit Gaucho Gil's main shrine in Mercedes. 
They bring trinkets and mementos like pictures and dresses as a way to give thanks for prayers that had been answered. You can go visit the main shrine in Mercedes, Argentina. Nearby are Argentina's largest wetlands, where you can see the Capybara, which is the largest rodent in the world. You should also visit Go the Travel Podcast, where you can see pictures of the things you heard about in today's podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Instagram. Thank you, Aurora, for helping out, and thank you for listening.